Good morning. I hope that this is the first of many videos that I will be able uh, to make about China as um, we track the momentous changes that are taking place and will be taking place there. Um, but I start in this video uh, by setting out five takeaways from the Chinese Communist Party Congress of last week, um, the 20th such Congress, uh, which in fact comes not far behind the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. Firstly, the most important takeaway from the 20th Communist Party Congress is that Xi Jinping is fully uh, in control of his party. This really should be um, understood against the background in which at the World Economic Forum in Davos in May this year, George Soros predicted what was uh, probably a consensual view among neoliberal elites at the time, namely that there are dissenting voices in the Communist Party um, and that Xi was not going to get his coveted and unprecedented third term in office. This turned out to be quite wrong. Xi was re-elected and the way now seems open to him as things stand, uh, possibly for him to continue indefinitely. All the politicians on the Politburo Standing Committee and in the wider Politburo who acquired their positions due to their relationships with previous Communist Party leaders, specifically with Jiang Zemin and Hu Qintao, were promoted, were, sorry, were removed from well before their retirement age. At the head of the list was Li Keqiang, who had been Xi's premier uh, since uh, 2012 and um, by whom Xi's um, critics were laying much store. Um, China is a, is, is a world away for many of us. and We have to get used to all these names. So what I've done is to put all the names and their pronunciations um, in the footnotes below this video um, in order that they, um, in, in the order that they appear in the discussion. Um, and I also add the names of those figures that I refer to, but don't actually say their names for, for those viewers who would like to have a fuller picture. Uh, lastly, I also list all the various bodies and committees of the Communist Party that I refer to. Um, the most important uh, ones uh, are the 24-man Politburo and the 7-man Politburo Standing Committee, headed by Xi Jinping, which is extracted from the wider Politburo um, and the, which is actually the nerve center of the Communist Party, um, which I shall shorten to um, just simply standing committee. One of the most controversial decisions that uh, Chi made early in 2022 uh, was to order the draconian um, two month long COVID lockdown uh, in Shanghai over the um, Omicron virus. This Li Qiang, uh, Chang, Shanghai um, Communist Party secretary, proceeded to enforce with perhaps excessive zeal, causing suffering to many residents, as well as causing, because of Shanghai's commercial importance, a significant economic slowdown with worldwide ramifications. It appears that, for instance, the oil price drop in that two month period was related to this. Although Li Qiang is a close ally of Qi, um, most people still believe that the lockdown had so tarnished his reputation that he couldn't possibly be promoted. And yet, not only was he promoted to the standing committee, but it is expected that he will become the next premier. In fact, Qi broke um, almost all norms with all his appointments. True, there was the retirement of his ally Li Changshu from the standing committee, um, due to his having reached the official retirement age, but that was the only concession that she would make to accepted norms. Apart from Li Qiang's appointment, three other close allies um, of his were brought into the standing committee. Tsai Chi, uh, Beijing Communist Party Secretary, Ding Shui Sang, um, Secretary of the General Office of the Communist Party, who becomes, in fact, Chief of Staff, and Li Qi, Guangdong Communist Party uh, Secretary, who becomes Secretary of the feared um, Central Commission for Discipline Inspection that um, uh, Xi Jinping had been using for the ruthless purges that he had become famous for. I will shorten uh, that committee's name simply to Corruption Commission. 
Jao Lechi, who had been responsible uh, for this commission and for the purges um, previously, stays on in the, in the Standing Committee and becomes overall head of the National Congress. Meanwhile, Wan Huning also stays on. He's head of the Central Commission for Comprehensively Deepening Reform, uh, which I'll, I will just call for ease uh, the Ideology Commission. This retaining Wen Huning is a further slap in the face of Li Kuchang and his allies since at 67 Wang is the same age as they are and he's probably even older than some of them. We come to the second um, takeaway um, about which regards the formation of the Ideology Commission by Qi in 2013, the very first year of his tenure and which tells us a great deal about his management style. This commission became a separate policy-making uh, unit reporting him to him directly um, and reduced, in fact, the Standing Committee, traditionally the nerve center of the Communist Party, to a mere executive body, distancing many of the members of the Standing Committee from some of the most important decisions that were being taken. If we look at who is now on the Standing Committee and how it's structured, all of its members are essentially uh, conduits for Qi's control over all the various structures of the Communist Party, consisting of specialist committees like the Central Political and Legal Affairs Committee, Commission, sorry, responsible for the Justice, Legal Enforcement and the Police, the Central Mi Military Commission, responsible for the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, which we actually have to remember is the armed wing of the Communist Party, and the para uh, paramilitary um, organization, the People, People's Armed Police. And we have also the National Development and Reform Commission, uh, the name of which um, I'll just shorten to Economic Reform Commission for ease. Um, these three important committees essentially are essentially equivalent in, in to, to what are normally called departments of state and are represented in the, in, in, the, in the broader Politburo, but not on the Standing Committee. So the second takeaway um, is about really about Chi's management style um, and his use of a spoken wheel system centered on him, um, where exceptionally the corruption and ideology, ideology commissions, which are run respectively by Li Chi and Wang Huning, are given stang, standing um, are given special status um, on the Standing Committee because they are um, not departments of state as such, but actually special arms that he uses for um, his for the overall structural reform that he is planning. And I will come back to that in the fifth takeaway. The third takeaway is, is the hardening of China's military and um, security posture. Xi's work report to Congress um, talks about the fact that he's, um, as he says, ready to withstand high winds, choppy waters and uh, even dangerous storms. It may be worth noting, given that Chinese and Russian leaders have developed a um, close friendship in the current geopolitical climate, that Vladimir Putin used much the same words at a recent v Valdai discussion club and at the end of October. So there appears to be agreement between the two leaders that from here, Unfortunately, it, um, the, the, the international scene is likely to get worse before it um, gets any better. It's actually also significant that within days of Congress winding up, Xi traveled with his standing committee to Yan'an, an old revolutionary base in northwest China's Shaanxi province, um, from which historically the Communist Party fought the Japanese invaders uh, and then from which it started its war of liberation. So appropriately, um, Xi's report talks about the combat, the combat readiness of the um, People's Liberation Army. His retention of um, Jian Hoxia on the broad Politburo as vice chair of the military commission together with um, the addition also there of um, General Hu Waidung as the second vice chair of the military commission, both reporting to Qi, who's the chairman, um, 
this indicates an, uh, an emphasis on having people in charge of the military uh, that have personal combat experience. Also, the, the first ever promotion of an intelligence um, officer to the center of power sees Minister of State Security uh, Chun Wenqing elevated uh, to the Politburo to run the Central Political and Legal, Legal Affairs Commission I talked about earlier, responsible for justice, legal enforcement and police. And um, in discussing military affairs in his report, Chi points out um, that at the same time that he is reducing the overall size of the People's Liberation Army, he's actually getting rid of 300,000 soldiers. A new, develop, a new emphasis is now being put on the rapid development of military technology, of new military technologies. Um, and so we see there a decisive shift of emphasis, uh, a shift away from brawn to brain. Indeed, Chi's um, new chief of staff, uh, Ding Shui Sang, comes from an engineering and materials science background uh, and is joined on the broader Politburo by five new figures with similar backgrounds in various high tech and defense sectors. And the names of all these I have put um, in the footnotes. In the fourth takeaway, we come to foreign affairs. Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who came to his post in 2012 when Xi first became leader, also is also elevated to the broader Politburo. This takeaway signals a continuity in the new harder approach to foreign policy called the fighting spirit, which has been carried out through uh, a combative, what's called uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. Xi is the one who's normally credited with having started this forceful foreign policy and with using the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the infrastructural development being carried out through various countries of the Global South, um, supposedly to change the world order. This is in fact how US President Biden sees it. He actually says of China right now under Xi that it represents the most consequential geopolitical challenge to the United States and that it maintains the intention and increasingly the capacity to reshape the international order. Following Biden's aggressive foreign policy and his attempt to impose worldwide sanctions on the export of semiconductors to China, Xi responds to that in his report with what he calls his clear-cut stance against hegemonism and power politics, insisting on the system his strategic resolve in the face of external attempts to blackmail, contain, blockade and exert maximum pressure on China. Combative words indeed. But the conflictual China-US relationship actually started before Trump and Biden, indeed much earlier, even before Xi came to power. Initially, the market reform period inaugurated by um, Deng, Xiao, Deng, um, Deng Xiaoping uh, in 1992 had been premised on a peaceful strategy, a peaceful foreign st policy strategy that was called hide capabilities and buy time. As China became the largest outsourcing platform for US and European multinationals um, in 2005, US Deputy Secretary of State um, Robert Zulick at the time described China's role as being that of a responsible stakeholder in the neoliberal world order clearly uh, under American hegemony. There was always the hope in the US that liberalizing the Chinese economy, especially after it joined the World Trade Organization with American support in 2001, that this might have the knock-on effect of somehow liberalizing Chinese politics. But although Xi's uncompromising persona now would appear to symbolize China's increasing illiberalism the country's international assertiveness started before his leadership, right after the great financial crash of 2007-8, in fact. During the subsequent Great Recession, it was China's stimulus package of some $600 billion, accounting for 12.5% of China's GDP, that by all accounts uh, was responsible for the um, eventual recovery of the world economy. This package was enacted by the government of Hu Jintao and his premier, Wu Jiabao. And 
after that happened, everything changed. Communist Party leaders, being Marxist-Leninists, think in, ter in historical terms. And the crash and the Chinese rescue of the world economy essentially meant that, in their eyes, the United States and its economic system had lost total legitimacy. Capitalism was now perceived to be on the decline and socialism inevitably on the rise. Hu Jintao gave a speech in 2009 in which he altered um, Deng Xiaoping's peaceful policy of high capabilities and by time. He laid out a new assertive foreign policy which said China had to actively accomplish something. Being the dialectical opposite in Marxist um, terms of Deng's strategy, this new idea would negate it. And as China began this process of asserting itself internationally, especially through the Belt and Road Initiative, who made a state visit to Washington in January 2011 to try and recalibrate China's relationship with the United States. But soon after, President Obama, obviously dissatisfied with his conversations with Hu, began the policy of containment of China, what he called the pivot to Asia strategy. Trump, President Trump, inherited the policy and, as we know, transformed it with his own additions and his combative rhetoric. So in this fourth takeaway, we start to see Xi Jinping in a, highly, in a slightly different light, not as someone single-handedly uh, changing Communist Party policy in according with his own lights, but as someone elected by the Communist Party to carry out a foreign policy, a foreign policy doctrine actually arrived at consensually. The fifth takeaway is about the shift occurring in China away from the economics of the so-called market reform period inaugurated by Deng Xiaoping um, towards a statist stance. Hu Lifeng, in charge of the Economic Reform Commission, who is now elevated um, to the broader Politburo, is a long-standing proponent of the statist turn. He is expected to be the new um, vice premier in charge of the economy, replacing Liu, Liu He, who retires along with a raft of free market advocates in the areas of central banking, bank regulation and finance administration. Again, all the names uh, of those people I have put in the footnotes. Given that the future expected premier, Li Qiang, is not particularly conversant with economics, unlike his predecessor, Hu Lifeng is expected to become a sort of economic tsar. It is principally this status turn which is deplored by neoliberal elites and that has made Xi so unpopular in their eyes. But the period of China's rise through export-led growth has more or less ended and something has to be done. Given that the exceptional growth of the past has been a result of an unprecedented investment boom, the necessity of change comes as internal limits to the available productive outlets for investment have been reached quite clearly, um, at, at least as, a common, as the economy is currently configured. We see this um, in, manifested in the frothy stock and real estate market. Um, the, we, see the, we saw the 2015 Shanghai stock market crash, the bull market and the stock market crash, uh, and the rise in house prices, and followed by the collapse in 2017 of the Evergrande Group. So the Chinese leadership are looking to steer the country through some considerable internal changes that will in turn have um, a, a significant impact on the world. Structural change is needed along a number of different vectors all at the same time. Um, changes that we can group under supply side and demand side categories. On the supply side, if China's current exporters, both Chinese and foreign um, uh, exporters, are to start supplying the domestic market, a number of things need to happen. First of all, government incentives tied to the um, export-led era need to change. This isn't particularly difficult. More difficult is the fact that the internal credit system needs to be strengthened to deal with a higher risk of default locally than internationally, uh, which needs clear um, financial sector reforms. Third, more local government transparency is required 
especially in terms of rules and regulations relating to production and construction sectors. Crucially, local monopolies and protection rackets have to be broken up. And last but not least, thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands, of local rail links need to be built. On the demand side, if Chinese consumption is to come into its own and start growing more substantially, it has to be recognized that the service sector is a, is, is a very important element of that, and therefore the service sector must be reg deregulated. Secondly, the vast potential of China's as, as yet untapped interior needs not only to be linked with the cities, as I just said, with better transport, but generally reorganized with better social welfare and household registration systems that can bolster um, uh, household income. And more generally, the demand side depends on achieving a higher wage economy. And this will depend not only on the development of the service sector, but on the shift of the ex export sector to higher value items, seeking to lower seeking to actually import all lower value and items from the Chinese periphery and from the global south through the Belt and Road um, system that has been constructed. Any notion that a so-called so free market can secure these outcomes is delusional. What of, what of, it is the ideological commission, the policy-making body represented at the highest levels of government in the Standing Committee and run by Wang Huning, that has the function precisely of coordinating the process of change through these vectors. It means, this means developing all the ideas and the relevant language that all the officials at the central and local levels of the Communist Party can understand and share in order to give them the ability to coordinate this turning of the country's modes of production and distribution um, and finance around. We have to remember that the Communist Party is a party of 96 million members that um, require a coherent framework um, from which um, to apply um, all the necessary changes um, under this structural reform package. While the use by Xi Jinping of the Corruption Commission for the purges of corrupt Communist Party members has been gleefully highlighted by the press and commentariat as the method by which he has disposed of his enemies and consolidated his power, little is understood of this Commission's crucial future crucial future importance in bringing about greater local government transparency, in breaking up local monopolies and protection rackets, and in helping in the deregulation and freeing up of the service sector. The success of the Communist Party in China's structural reforms, the legitimacy of its interventions, and the message this conveys to the population at large requires it to be a neutral actor, and this is only possible through what what Qi calls constant self-renewal, the sense of which clearly um, has traveled with Qi since his days um, under the Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution. The performance of the economic, the economic Tsar and thus of the, 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 the Economic Reform Commission will be dependent on how these, the, the, the ideology and the corruption, the, the corruption commissions perform. To conclude, the five takeaways are Xi Jinping's total control of the Communist Party, two, the importance of the corruption and ideology commissions to structural reform, three, the considerable hardening of the military and security positions of the Communist Party, four, China's assertive foreign policy, which predates Xi in fact, and five, the status turn to bring about radical reform towards a consumption and high wage economy, which is necessarily, necessarily supported by an aggressive foreign policy promoting the Belt and Road Initiative through the Global South. Xi comes out of this Congress as totally in control of the destiny of a nation of 1.5 billion people, a nation facing once again the prospect of enormous transformation, but which has already proven 
its capacity for grasping the nettle of change when necessary. What the source of Qi's power is and how he came by it is a very important subject if we are to understand how Chinese politics functions. But this can't be covered here. We'll have to do a separate video for that, which I hope you will watch. Thank you for watching this video.